The purpose of this session is to provide a deep dive into the public and private sector resources available to help startups and small businesses go global. As the last session in this series, this event brings together all of the elements previously discussed and will present solutions to creating an export plan for your global growth. The format will be moderated discussion around a service and a product and a tech facet of two small uh, fictitious business case studies. So the goal here is to provide examples of how these hypothetical businesses can utilize digital tools and resources like those offered by our panelists tonight and panelists and experts that we've had in the previous five sessions to establish a successful export strategy. So my name is Michael McLoon, uh, the International Business Accelerator, and I wanted to thank uh, in this final session, particularly the Global Innovation Forum, uh, globalinnovationforum.com, Jake and Jamaica. It's uh, something that they've done in half-day in-person sessions. And this is the first time that they've done a multi-panel, multi-series event. Uh, and here in Southern California and Los Angeles, we're, we're honored to have that partnership. Uh, they, speaking of partnerships, they're partnered with the International Trade Administration. So thank you to Pat and Tricia. Uh, seems like uh, ages ago, we actually, actually sat face to face planning this out uh, earlier in 2020. Um, the United States Commercial Service is also a presenter of this series. Uh, Terry Batch is here. I encourage her to put her email in the chat. And I encourage everyone listening to contact Terry as she is the absolute maven of trade in uh, here in LA and Southern California. So thanks also to the Milken Institute for being the host and the production partners. Thanks to Eugene and Kevin and Aaron for your expert uh, uh, leadership in both moderation and, and production. Uh, Loyola and Marymount University, one of our favorite universities here in, uh, in Los Angeles. We had uh, the Dean of the Business School moderate uh, a recent panel and she was saying that they have a social entrepreneurship uh, global program starting in the spring, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and they're always highly ranked uh, nationally in their program. Uh, the International Business Accelerator uh, is a nonprofit acceleration program for small businesses to go into the global markets quickly, profitably and compliantly. And then Global Lava, Lava standing for Los Angeles Venture Association. Uh, there's the global community of which I'm honored to chair and lead. It's a mesh network of founders and funders and they meet and, and discuss and hopefully put together growth capital for global growth um, uh, strategies and, uh, and whatever's needed to go into international markets. So um, thanks to everyone, uh, you know, the presenters and the partners and, and everyone here. So let's go into this last session. Uh, I would like to introduce our panelists. We'll start with Chris Lynch, and then we'll go with Veronica, and then we'll go with Ray. And as always, we're going to provide you a really great mix of academia and private sector, public sector, and everything else that wraps it all up nicely. So we're going to learn a lot about uh, free resources tonight. So get your pens and paper out. So Chris? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, Glad to be here tonight. The, what I'm gonna do is, is sort of bring to you um, uh, some, from my own personal experience, some of the, the great resources that uh, startups and small uh, businesses, medium-sized businesses can call upon when they are going to be uh, looking to go into to global markets. Uh, by way of background, I was a uh, US Foreign Service Officer with the State Department. Um, although in two posts I did um, supervise the work of both the Commerce Department uh, Commercial Service and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, so I was able to, um, to get a, a fair overview of, of, you know, understanding of the government side of the programs. Um, since I uh, retired, I've been back here in the States in California. I founded the, the International Business Accelerator because I found there was this, uh, in, in terms of the business accelerators, surprisingly, none of them had really focused on bringing uh, their founders, the, the, the startup companies, to think about them going into international markets. And I uh, worked with a couple who had actually made some really kind of blunders and cost them a lot of money because they didn't think ahead in this whole process. So, um, and, and I also teach, I teach international business up at Golden Gate University. 
as well as economics at uh, Long Beach City College. So what I'm gonna do is talk about this. Of course, we've talked about the US Commercial Service and uh, Terry has uh, talked previously about this. There's incredible wealth of services and trade.gov is certainly a wealth. It's where we tell everybody, all of our uh, clients in the International Business Accelerator where to start looking for resources and data. Um, to go down, sort of divide things down by the kinds of resources that you can uh, tap into. Um, on the, the federal level, there's not only the Department of Commerce, as I mentioned, the Department of Agriculture. If you have a food product, uh, they have quite a number of programs that will, will be able to help you. There's the, of course, the Export Import Bank that we talked about previously. Uh, one that we haven't mentioned and perhaps will be of, of um, uh, something we can bring in one of the, our two case studies tonight is the Development Finance Corporation, which is a recent uh, amalgamation of a number of smaller federal agencies uh, that are able to provide uh, development financing, including some uh, uh, engineering um, uh, pre, pre, um, pre bid kind of uh, where you're, you're developing your proposal. Um, in addition to that, there are monies that are available from the US Agency for International Development, USAID, a lot of developing countries, uh, money definitely to be, um, that you can come across in that one. Uh, at our state level, we have uh, the, um, uh, go biz and we have the certainly we have the uh, their step program and I think I'll let to Ray because he's has a lot of success in, in discussing uh, in actually bringing clients through the step program it's a great resource for uh, small business um, and of course there are the many kinds of smaller um, localized entities uh, here in in the Los Angeles area we have uh, almost an embarrassment of riches in terms of the kind of, of resources here. We were uh, talking today with a, a, a client, potential client in the in the Middle East, and uh, we we told her that you know this is you know the place to be if you're going to be talking about international international business, and certainly in terms of um, what's available here in Southern California, you can find the expert who knows just the most you know obscure little details about anything to do with international business you can find that person right here in this area the question is just getting out and reaching out certainly we have things like the world trade center we have the deck which is the um the uh, the equivalent to the um score to the uh department of commerce uh, uh, people who are actual practitioners in the field and provide advisory services. Uh, we, Michael mentioned some of the universities that are working here. They have programs, uh, both uh, Ray and I know that even the community colleges are a real resource here. Uh, if you're looking for um, you know, trained uh, employees, there's any number of excellent uh, programs that can, that can do that. Um, I would also add that just when you're looking outside of the United States, there's all kinds of some other kinds of less obvious uh, resources you can do. Of course, we have our, our consular corps and we have in Washington, uh, the embassies of, of the countries uh, that were um, involved there. I was, my last posting in, in the State Department, I was consul general at Hamburg. We had at that time a larger Consular Corps than LA, but I think it's kind of shrunk over the years. But it's, you know, being there in, in the ports, there are these resources. They're primarily interested and in, generally interested in you um, uh, actually buying from whatever country that they're in um, or investing whatever country that they're in. Although there are a number of them like Singapore, Hong Kong, which are really interested in, in bilateral trade. Um, and and Korea is, is somewhat in that in that area. Um, other resources for you to think about um, globally 
when you're going into a country, we do have a World Trade Center here. There is um, a network, and depending, it varies the strength country by country of World Trade Centers in other countries. Um, in almost every country around the world, there's a, an American Chamber of Commerce abroad. So it'd be, for example, when I was um, in El Salvador, there was uh, AmCham El Salvador. And, you know, it's, I, was, I was on the board of that. Um, it's a group of business people who are interested in bilateral trade. So if you have, for example, wanting to say, in this case, say to export to El Salvador, um, if you get in touch with the folks at AmCham El Salvador, they can often refer you to um, expert people. They can maybe suggest some, some partners. Uh, maybe they can also steer you away from some partners. Uh, sometimes that's just as valuable as anything else. Uh, depending upon the countries, they have very structured programs. Others are not, not as structured. Um, the counterpart to that are the local chambers of commerce. So there is a, uh, Chamber of Commerce in uh, San Salvador. There's um, a really great uh, Chambers of Commerce, for example, in China. Uh, places like, you know, Shanghai has a, a really well-developed one. Um, so those are people who can provide you a full uh, menu of, of contacts and um, associations um, within their country. In certain Middle Eastern countries, uh, the Chamber of Commerce has been basically set up to filter and to pair up uh, outside businesses, Western businesses with local businesses. So in certain of these countries, you actually have to join the um, Chamber of Commerce locally. Um, in, you know, it, 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 depend, it depends on, on countries. In Germany, for example, when I was there, it was obligatory to belong to the Chamber of Commerce uh, because they actually did the equivalent of, of the business registries that you have here in uh, that are done by our, our, our city governments. Uh, so, but at any rate, it, it certainly is a resource that is worth considering. Um, and then just lastly, because I don't want to go on, I could go on all evening about all these little uh, trips, tricks and so forth is uh, the trade associations. And I think that's some of the most valuable ones that you can have out there. Um, if you are, you know, say exporting, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical goods, there is a undoubtedly a pharmaceutical manufacturers association. Why are they useful? A, because they can know everybody there in the, particular uh, community, uh, they'll be able to steer you. I've also found that in terms of market research, they're really good. A lot of times they will do market surveys and you may have to pay for these. Some of them can be quite pricey, but they will get, actually get down to the prices of individual products or a range of products and they'll still so, be listing up there. So yeah. So this is a good time talking about market research to go over to Veronica. Yeah, I'm sorry. And, yeah, that's I'll leave. I'll, I'll leave. Go there. I'll, I'll just cut off there. I, I told you. I told everybody to get their pens and paper out because we have uh, Ray and Chris, both international uh, business professors. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Veronica, week was at the end too. Yeah, and and I should say that uh, for everybody who just uh, went through that whole list, and you don't have a pen and pad, and you probably have a an adult beverage at uh, 5.15 in the evening, at least specific time. We'll have that list for you as a wrap up to this, uh, this panel. So uh, Veronica, can we hear a little bit about what Google has for uh, sure. market research? Sure, thank you. And thanks for having me, Michael. Chris, I have my pen and paper ready. I have one page already full of notes. So I'm, I'm happy that I have a brand new notebook ready to kickstart the session. So um, everybody, good to meet you. I'm Veronica Samuelis, and I'm an International Growth Program Manager at Google. 
I'm focused on helping businesses expand internationally using tools like Google Market Finder to help them build their export plan, and then also Google Ads to help them reach their international audiences. Um, now, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with Google Market Finder, so I actually brought a video to share with everybody to give you a sense of what the user interface looks like, as well as the kinds of resources that are available at Market Finder. Let's see, and Sam and Danielle, can you please play the video for us? Google's free market finder tool can help you find global markets to export your products to. Market Finder uses Google's unique data insights to help businesses make informed decisions about international growth in a matter of seconds. John has founded a juice store. Market Finder can help John to discover potential export markets, develop a marketing strategy, and understand the operations of every step. John gets started by entering his website URL. Market Finder scans the website and identifies relevant categories for John's markets based on the products that he can export. Combining the product categories with Google's unique data insights and search volume metrics, Market Finder selects the three markets with the highest export potential for John's business. John creates and completes his profile selecting and confirming the key export markets in order to delve deeper into the metrics and logistics of each one. John explores the market insights to discover key information about each market, such as the country, economic, and online profile. Using Market Finder, John can easily compare each potential market to his current one. The insights can show how much people earn on average and the number of monthly searches for juices, as well as the ease of doing business in that market and the logistics of exporting. This information allows John to benchmark each market against his existing one and plan his market export strategy. John has analyzed the potential new markets for juice bids and now wants to plan his operations. John uses Market Finder to understand which payment method is best for the German market and search for a payment provider that can help him export to this market. After setting up his operations, John wants to discover how to reach the right audience in Germany. He uses Market Finder to create an international marketing strategy to support his advertising and measure his success abroad. Guides, articles, and case studies tailored to his business objectives are at his disposal, and John can learn about popular keywords with data sourced from Google Trends. Just one of the useful tools and services available to him. With the help of Market Finder, John can create great campaigns for his new market. In response to COVID-19, we made a global COVID-19 hub to help businesses like John's optimize their performance. This hub has various resources, including consumer and demand insight, operations best practices, daily updated market trade measures from international trade center market analysis tools, and more. All the information that John needs to export successfully is now in one place. Google Market Finder. No matter what you sell or where you sell it, find new customers abroad and take your business further. Get started today. Thank you. Thank you. So that gives you a sense of some of the resources that are available in Google Market Finder. And as we continue through the panel today, I can share more specific examples on how the audience can, can leverage this tool in conjunction with the other resources and partnerships that are being presented today in the panel. All right. Thank you, Veronica. Speaking of resources, Dr. Ray Bowman, sitting on uh, mountains and mountains of them, right? <laughs> yeah. Tell us about them. And yourself, yeah. of course. So thank you, Michael. So a little bit about myself. Um, so I live in a couple different worlds. So um, international trade-wise, I spent um, 
I've been involved in global trade well over 35 years. I, I spent 28 years in customs brokerage and freight forwarding in that industry. Um, then I uh, got into my own trade consulting business. Um, I've been with the Small Business Development Center program for, um, for about uh, 12 years. Um, I also do um, the academic side of me. I also do research uh, in areas of entrepreneurship I study programs like this and their effectiveness, as well as um, uh, doing work in entrepreneurship and uh, looking at different trade trends. Um, and I also teach at Cal State Channel Islands, as well as Babson College in the Babson Global Program in Boston. And I'm also a member of the District Export Council. I belong to the Southern California District Export Council chapter. And um, the District Export Council are trade professionals um, that are appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce to help promote trade and exports, U.S. trade and exports. So I'm a part of that as well. But as far as the Small Business Development Center program, which I'm a center director of, it's an SBA program. So uh, if you look at the program, there's over a thousand service centers like mine throughout the country. So I'm one of those service centers. Um, I'm a service center within the Los Angeles network. So a couple of the hats I wear within the LA network is I'm a center director for Ventura in Santa Barbara County uh, here in Southern California. But then uh, the other hat I wear is I coordinate all of our international trade technical consulting for the entire LA network, which there are nine centers. Um, so I have a team of specialists, trade specialists. And what we do is we support the um, the work that's done with businesses throughout the SBDC network. And uh, so if you look in the entire state of California, we see about 80,000 plus clients a year. Uh, in the LA area alone, we deal with several hundred uh, trade clients every year. I think we're active clients right now, we're dealing with about 500 uh, companies that are conducting both import and export activities. The way we support those firms is through direct one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. So it's all about matching talent with talent. So we're blessed to have a lot of great trade professionals um, that can sit down on a whole variety of issues. Um, so we uh, work with clients on understanding, you know, uh, documentation, uh, both import and export regulations, uh, IP uh, contracts involving both international buyers and sellers, um, we support foreign direct investment. Uh, so those entrepreneurs overseas are trying to establish here. We also work with those entrepreneurs trying to uh, expand into foreign markets, whether that expansion is, you know, direct exports or if it's getting their IP out there or establishing ventures overseas, we support all those kinds of activities. So literally we have experts that can uh, deal in finance, regulations, marketing, um, uh, sales, uh, look at uh, pricing. Um, so we, we cover a whole range of, of different topics within our program. Um, my specific center, um, we also have several other programs that sort of dovetail in with the international program. Uh, one program is we have a, a program called EDC Invest. And that's a program that, that helps companies that are looking for venture capital and seed funding. Um, so we work a lot with companies looking for A and B rounds of funding. And we have a combination of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance as well as putting together expert panels to help those companies prepare for when they're soliciting uh, capital, whether it's capital here or abroad. We also have a program called Fathomworks which is a cooperative agreement between the US Navy and the Port of Wainimi. And uh, in that program, what we do is we try to facilitate um, tech transfer between the government and introducing entrepreneurs to the government and the government to those entrepreneurs to engineer solutions. So part of Fathomworks is we have a 60,000 square foot advanced prototyping facility that includes environmental testing, uh, prototyping. We have a metal 3D printer. We have uh, underwater test tanks. So the 
the whole idea to that is to use the talent of our entrepreneurs and connect that to uh, to resources through the government and procurement. Um, so as Rich, yes. As, as you talk about the resources and the programs, because it's, uh, it's almost 24 after, yeah. let's, let's put those programs and those resources and all this expertise that you have your hands on and, and Chris has knowledge of and okay. Monica has technical. Let's, let's go into the, uh, the case studies of the, of the, okay. two, the two companies. Uh, quickly, uh, we're putting some information in the chat, but if you do have questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A. Makes it a lot easier for, uh, for us if the questions for the panelists go into the Q&A. Um, okay, so we're working with two different companies here. Uh, business A is a service. So it's a small architecture firm it's based in LA. They have five people on staff and it was spun out of a larger company. So they've averaged about 2 million in sales over the last three years. So they know what they're doing, they have traction. Uh, they've worked on US embassies in the past but of course that's American property, so it's not considered technically an export. So what they're looking for is an anchor project with an international client. Okay, so that's it'll establish them as a business in a new foreign market. And they're particularly interested in exploring opportunities in Africa where the founder has ties. And we're gonna presume they're smart enough to know that seven out of the 10 fastest growing company, uh, sorry, markets are in Africa. So there's a high growth opportunity uh, on the entire continent. So let's go uh, alphabetically. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we got the second, sorry, second uh, case study. We have um, a small IT and uh, health tech company. So it's both a physical product and a tech service or a platform. So it's a small health IT company also based here. They sell FDA approved post therapy, internet of things, wearable devices to patients and they provide the data to the insurance and they obviously sell that, right? So they have had success domestically, but they don't really know what they're doing internationally. So they're starting from, uh, from uh, step one. So they've gained international recognition after they won a pitch award and now the UK has expressed interest in either buying or partnering with, buying the products or partnering with them. So they're interested in discovering how to start, right? So uh, we're gonna go through five guiding questions. Let's make them kind of quick so we can have the, the Q&A uh, robust at the end. So let's say two things for these guys to get started. So for business A and business B, they've been successful here. What's the next step before they identify their country of interest? What are the two things that they really need to know before they begin the export process? Uh, we'll go Chris, Ray, and Veronica. Chris, two um, things. Two things. Uh... They need to, for, for business A, it's um, uh, just understanding the, um, uh, the, the international, mar the, the, the potential market out there. I mean, what, what other people are doing. And then um, B um, is to, to understand what kind of um, resources might be available to them. Great, Ray, what, what two things do they have to think of before they even decide where? So, <clears throat> so with these firms, I, I'm often asked what the difference is between an international firm and one that doesn't do international trade. And we actually have, have done some research uh, throughout California looking at trade versus non-trading companies. And one of the differences that I think is really critical that leads to these questions is innovation. Um, uh, a, a lot of international companies, um, they tend to hire more people, they tend to generate more income, um, and, and they tend to live longer, uh, almost 10 years longer than their domestic counterparts. And a big part of that is because of innovation. In other words, they, you have to be able to adapt yourself to different markets. So part of the first step is saying, okay, what are the strengths of these companies? And now what modifications do they have to make in those foreign markets, right? To still keep the value going. So a big part of international is understanding how to innovate your business model to adapt the same success you have here to that market. So uh, again, you know, looking at uh, for the medical company, looking at regulations, how they have to adapt for the architectural firm, how that market is gonna be different in that country. Great, fantastic. Veronica, 
How about you? Two things? Sure, two things. Well, first off, I'd say that even before identifying what markets to expand to, it's really important to, you know, focus on building a sound export plan, right? So this is going to take time to build and execute against this plan and also knowing that there are a number of resources and partners who can help you establish this plan along the way. The second thing that I wanted to point out is that the U.S. is a massive market and it's very diverse. So as you're considering what markets you want to expand to, think of the U.S. as your test market before even expanding internationally, right? So let's say, for instance, for either of these companies, whether you're service oriented or if you're selling a product, let's say you want to reach a Spanish speaking audience. Why not consider uh, localizing your website, for instance, into Spanish, testing this amongst the millions of U.S. Hispanics um, prior to even going beyond borders and launching this abroad? And that's the beauty of L.A., right? <laughs> We have that all right here. Um, okay, so let's reverse that and Veronica, stay with you. So as you identify the countries of interest, like how can these two businesses choose which new markets to enter to be the best and most efficient and most profitable uh, and easiest as far as regulation and everything else? Does, what does Google have here in Market Finder that's available to assist and how do they use it? Sure, sure. So I would say that for both of these businesses, right, it, it starts in the same manner as was described in that video. You start with the prompt of entering your website into Market Finder. So whether you're a service or a product, you use it the same way. What Market Finder will do is it will look at a variety. Um, well, first, it will look at what industries comprise of, of your website, and you have the opportunity to refine the categories to make sure that it um, best describes your business. So for instance, for business A with architecture, you'll find that there are a number of um, architectural categories that are available, architecture, service-oriented architecture, architectural engineering, to name a few, or in regards to um, the, the health tech products, um, heart rate monitors, blood pressure monitors, et cetera, you're able to really refine the categories. And what Market Finder does is it ultimately looks at what demand is for these categories that you've selected across markets. It looks at this in combination with how competitive the markets are, what is the ease of doing business in these markets as described in the World Bank and then a variety of economic factors. And Market Finder will then give you a set of three recommended countries, for instance. So you can either start with these recommended countries and look at the um, country insights to help inform your, your strategies and what markets you might wanna consider going into or if you already have potential markets that you're interested in, such as an architectural company who's interested in expanding into Africa, what you're able to do is once you log into the Market Finder tool, you're able to select specific African countries that you'd like to learn more about and really you know, dive into the, the data and the insights again to help you inform the strategy that you're going to take when you expand to these markets. Excellent. Thank you for that. And forgive me for backtracking, but I know that in the answer to the first question, you mentioned that you got to build the plan. And our accelerators are partnered with Google for startups. So mm -hmm. startup.google.com. I know it's not your department, but let me give a shout out. As you build the plan, there, there are tremendous uh, resources there. Uh, again, that's startup.google.com. And you are uh, very liberal with your credits. So I think we get up to $20,000 in credits for Firebase and, and Google Cloud that we give to our portfolio companies. And I believe that uh, other startups, independent of accelerators and incubators, can also get some of those credits. So, um, Ray, uh, let's go to you. How, besides using Market Finder, and uh, yeah, in our accelerator, we also, I mean, we love what the U.S. Uh, commercial Service does. So they have, uh, what is it, Inter International Market Check, I believe, is one of the tools that are out there. Um, and, of course, we have... Uh, we have interns from LMU. We'll give a shout out to LMU as well for market research. But Ray, what, what do you what do you think about how to identify that country? Um, one of the ways I work when I work with clients to identify countries. Uh, again, there's so many great tools out there, and the U.S. Department of Commerce, Commerce through Export.gov and the ITA, they've got a lot of great information on what is being exported out of this country as well as what's being imported. Um, from other countries. So um, one first step is identifying if you're dealing with goods, your harmonized code. So um, that's a six digit code that's harmonized throughout the world that allows you to identify products. 
And you can identify services in a similar way by just looking at complementary products that would complement your service. But what's great is you can, we keep track of those exports so you can get data on what your top export markets are. Now, again, which countries do you pick? And really, I look at it in two ways. One is, once you get the data on your top countries, I always follow the 80-20 rule, right? Um, you know, 80% of, you know, your revenue and success will probably be locked up in about 20% of those markets. So um, I always look at what that 80% is. Sometimes the 80% is two markets, sometimes it's 10. But then looking at that, what represents the 80% of that export volume, and then making some decisions as to the effort and resources you have. Can you only concentrate on one market or concentrate on many? The second step that I urge you to do is not only look at the markets, but look at the industries within um, that market. So from there, I, I, I'll usually walk a client through an industry analysis. So um, I use uh, something that's been used by a lot of people, a, a five, they call it a five force analysis. Well, but what I urge clients to do is look at what the industry does within that market and how it's gonna affect your business model. So I always decide which target markets to use by using a combination of both market as well as industry analysis. And again, you can get some really good data that we walk clients through all the time. And what's great is most of that data is free and uh, that can help you decide what those markets are. Right, like Chris said, an embarrassment of riches here in our market. Yes. Right? Um, Chris, what are your thoughts on yeah. identifying those countries? Yeah, um, it probably doesn't apply to the two specific ones, but one of the things we always look at is, is one where we have a, a free trade agreement. And, and the benefit of that is that it, it not only lays out, you know, generally they're, they're, you'll face either low or no, no tariffs, but it really lays out the rules of the game. Um, and it's much stronger in terms of things like intellectual property uh, protections, um, uh, investment protections. Uh, there's times even with uh, customs issues, um, how much you can bring in on a de minimis kind of, of, of operation and so forth. So that's, that's certainly one thing. There are other kinds of, of uh, agreements which are um, having, you know, not as much uh, protections out there, but that's certainly one to do where there's that. Um, and then I guess the second thing to do in that is, is that, um, is how easily can you, in choosing between the countries, where can you find partners? I mean, like for the health uh, uh, technology company, you know, how can you find somebody who's a partner to guide you through the regulatory process that you have to do there? Um, and on the engineering one, you know, you're going to need partners to figure out, to help you understand the local markets within each of the, you know, the, the African countries, because it, it, it's, you know, global business still is a personal relationship business. Right. Particularly in developing countries like Africa, where you need to trust your, your partner because the legal system may not support uh, any differences of opinion. Uh, I'll just throw out a very specific uh, tool if, for the company that would go into the UK. The United Kingdom has a Department of International Trade and they're fantastic. There's a guy here in Los Angeles by the name of Matthew Melling. He's a uh, gentleman and a scholar. And then the city of London also has their own accelerator and they welcome US companies with open arms. So they can start conversations with you know, the national health system. Uh, they could also guide you through the data governance issues for, you know, if you're selling, uh, you know, data to insurers. So there's also the partners on, on the other side in the UK, uh, London and partners is, is, is the London one. So uh, I can put some information in the chat of those guys because they're, they're fantastic. So the third question out of five is, so these companies have completed their market research and they've established the markets they want to enter. So what's the next step in the planning of the operations in that new country? So there are all kinds of factors and facets. So, you know, what what tools and resources would you present or recommend? Uh, and everything from financing to localization to logistics and supply chain, the compliance of the rules and the regulatory uh, over there. Uh, 
How about people, the talent, uh, recruitment, uh, what kind of partnerships and joint ventures? Are there any special considerations uh, for tech companies versus products? You know, what, um, I know it's a very broad question, but as far as planning the operations, let's look at the company as they go into that foreign market. Chris? Um, yeah, um, I guess the two things I'd be looking at is, um, uh, first of all, the, the localization, what, what you have to do, and that covers a broad number of areas, uh, uh, including uh, regulatory ones, but, but also even on the, um, your, your, your online presence, having, you, there may be things that you need, and um, I'll let Veronica, uh, she's got certainly all kinds of insights into that. Um, and the second thing is, is that it, it's a concept that applies more to, to products, but it's equally valid with um, services is that your, your landed price. In other words, what's going to be your price in the local currency compared to the other um, producers, uh, competitors in that local currency? Because that, that really says where you are in the market. Are you a high, high value one? Are you competitive? Are you the, uh, the, the cost, the, the interrupter in the market? Right. And Veronica, what are your thoughts on planning the operations? Sure. So when it comes to planning operations, we actually look at this as the, the second stage in, in Market Finder, where we have a complete operations section that's broken across six different categories. You named a few of them with localization, payments. We also have customer care, logistics, talent recruitment, as well as tax and legal. And you'll find that when you dive into these particular operational areas, that we have various resources, guides, even vendor recommendations to help you get started to ensure that your operations will, um, can, that, that you're more able to set up for success before you expand abroad. So for instance, if you look at localization, right, it's no surprise that the majority of consumers, that they're gonna spend more of their time on websites that are in their own language. And some of the things that you should think about is you're setting up your, your web presence um, in, in markets abroad is that you need to think beyond just translating the language, right? You also need to think about about localizing your currencies, your number formatting, dates, um, what is the local lingo, local customs, um, and really aim to provide a local experience for your export markets. Um, what's great is that in Market Finder, we do offer a localization quiz um, to help you understand, okay, well, what are the resources that you need um, that you can start preparing before you even start working with a localization vendor? Also, we have a number of country guides that are available for you that you can share directly with your content developers so that you can start localizing some of the content on your pages um, but as, as, you're, as you're localizing for, for new markets. Um, similarly, when it comes to payments um, and Market Finder, um, once you've identified the markets that you're interested in expanding to, you can see, okay, well, what are the top forms of payment? So this is more relevant to, to business B, right, where you're selling a tech product or um, a, a tech or health product that you'll want to understand, okay, well, what are the top forms of payment that are popular or favored in your export country? Um, you can select how to find a payments provider to understand who are the payment providers who can help you implement on this. These are just two of the examples out of the many in the operations section, but I wanted to, to highlight those and share those with you. Excellent, and for those who have not seen the previous panels, Veronica just went through almost entirely what we've done in the last five, uh, five panels. So we've had into it. We've had PayPal talk about global processing and, and you know, moving currency. Uh, we've talked about defending yourself in intellectual property. We had a great one on the e-commerce and digital strategy, all the things to think about. So we had two business professors and Veronica's giving us a quiz. That's a theme that we've been going through is the educational component of going global. And uh, again, we've been embarrassment of riches of experts who can give you that information for free. So um, speaking of experts, let's go back to uh, Ray. Let's talk about reaching customers. So let's look at business A and business B. What strategy should they use in your experience of working with all these startups and founders and even you know, SMEs and, and larger companies? What, what strategies should they be using to reach the customers so they can get paid, so they can get repeat customers, so they can get uh, you know, a brand established in those foreign markets? Well, I, well, I think with whatever your target country is, um, 
and this is an exercise we do with entrepreneurs all the time is imagine your ecosystem, close your eyes and not only imagine your customers, but the whole ecosystem around it. And, and so to that, a, a, a big source of finding your customers once you've found the market is to find your industry. And, you know, there's an industry for everything. I've, I've got a book in my library that's just a, a registry of industry associations. And, and so it's really important to know what the industry association is in your target market, because chances are they'll have trade show activity. And that trade show activity is a real insight as to the products that are hot in that market, who are the players, who's the competition, who are the potential buyers. You know, since a lot of international business is a, a B2B transaction, it enables you to do that kind of identification. So um, there's, a, uh, there's a website I've used in the past called Trade Show Central that enables you to search trade shows all around the world. And, and that's a good resource because you can identify what those key industry shows are within that market. So you can sort of drill down to the customer. Another big resource is just going on the internet, um, looking at your competitors, find out where they're located, uh, looking up their product reviews in the target country, looking at what people are saying about that product in that target country. So, you know, with the internet, there's so many great ways we can look at both the industry as well as target the customer by getting feedback just through uh, research on the internet. So I think those are uh, important ways. Using the US commercial service, um, they have some great products from uh, the Gold Key service to some of their distributor services. Um, what's great about the commercial service is they have people in country uh, who can give you a lot of insight as to strategies that they've seen work as far as getting to your target customer. Um, the other thing that's important, and this also kind of answers the last question about operations, is use your resource partners, right? So you can't do international trade without having a relationship with a bank that has a background in international trade, using legal counsel that has an international background, um, working with freight forwarders, working with um, inspection companies. And all of these partners, they not only help support your business, but they have a lot of knowledge about the customers in the target country. Um, so they're always a great resource to, to really figure out who that persona is of your target of your target customer. So those are all great ways to drill down from market intelligence down to who should I actually make a sales call to. Excellent. Um, quick question, the Industry Association book that you mentioned, does that have a title or is that a personal collection or a tome of, of Ray Bowman? No, I'll have to look up the book and it's, I should have brought it, it's right over like Okay. Shouting distance, but it's a it's a whole um, it's an industry registry of trade associations, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a huge book, but it's it's really useful. But you know, all we have to do is anyone who's driven down the main boulevard in Vegas will see all these, you know, all these hotels listing some kind of conference or trade show, and that's another good way to find customers. You don't often have to go to the target country. We have a lot of huge trade shows right here, and your average U.S. domestic show can have as many as 30, 40,000 international buyers. Um, so, you know, you, a lot of contacts can be made through these domestic shows as well as international. And um, another great way to subsidize that effort is through the STEP grant program. This is a program that comes from the SBA that goes through the uh, each state gets an allotment of step grant money, and it helps subsidize some of those marketing activities. Um, they've upped the amount of the award to that, but these are uh, a great source of, of getting some of the tools that you need and expending, um, getting some of the monies you need to reimburse you for some of those efforts. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Chris, you want to add your um, sense about reaching the customers? Yeah, I mean, it's... It, it's um... I, I think with sort of lessons learned from what we're going through with, with the whole pandemic right now is that many more things can be done 
online than we thought before. Um, I hope that some of the trade shows will now sort of incorporate, um, uh, you know, some online parts of it. it. It's a way certainly to expand the, the audience. I think ultimately they still will be there because they, that person to person relationship is, is still um, so important there. Um, and the other thing is too, is just to um, think about in terms of the, um, I, I find it, what, I, what I found from this, this whole series is that they're really now to, to think now of, of the tech companies, not as, as platform providers, but they really are becoming partners in this whole uh, process. And they realize that by providing the, the data and the information they have, like Google has, uh, they can provide all these ins in their insights and it ultimately benefits them. So I think that, uh, to, you know, uh, go beyond sort of the traditional ones that are providing information. But uh, our tech partners, our tech companies are our partners now. Okay, uh, just one uh, reminder, if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A because we're coming up on our, uh, our final uh, of the five guiding questions. Uh, Veronica, if you want to add more about reaching customers, uh, you know, as I was mentioning for Business A and Business B and the strategy, they're in, uh, that'd be great. And then after that, we'll go right into the uh, challenges. What's the biggest challenge that you would flag for small businesses is they seek to expand their business globally. And how can these two small businesses address the challenge that, well, your, your chosen challenge? <laughs> Absolutely. So first off, in regards to reaching customers, I'd absolutely recommend that um, businesses, of course, uh, include digital in, in your marketing strategy, right? It's flexible. It allows you to A-B test and iterate quickly, and it's measurable. Um, Google Ads, as you can imagine, um, can certainly help you reach your international audience. We have eight platforms with over a billion users from Google Search, YouTube, Gmail, Google Play, etc. And ultimately, as you're building your marketing strategies to reach your international audience, I'd ask that you consider how you would promote your products and services alike using search, YouTube, and, and display. Um, now, in we, we've talked a lot about the services and the resources that are available in Market Finder, but I also wanted to highlight that in the marketing section of Market Finder, we also have a list of agencies who are, um, who are certified in internationalization and who can help companies build their international campaigns. Also for those companies who are still building their presence online and are getting started with Google Ads, I do want to point out that Grow with Google, that they have excellent video trainings on establishing your online presence and getting started with Google Ads. So there are a number of Google resources that, that are available to, to help small and medium businesses get started. Now, in regards to your second question, Michael, in regards to, you know, what are the biggest challenges that small businesses um, can, can face and what are, what's my recommendation for that? And ultimately, it's that as small and medium businesses plan their expert strategy, that's really essential, right, to look for the right partners, whether it's payment processors, logistics providers, marketing agencies, you name it. Um, the truth is that nobody does it alone, and I think we've heard that through, through the panelists today, right? And as a small and medium business, it's even more important. There are hundreds of other companies that have already taken the path that you're ready to embark they've learned mistakes, they've learned from them, and they can help you avoid those common pitfalls. So I'd urge companies that as, as, you, as you start to build your export plan and identify the markets you're looking to expand to and build your export strategies, um, remember that you don't need to be an export expert on your own. Um, instead, look for partners who can really help you and, and ease your export journey. And Google being that number one partner, right? One of many, one of yeah. many. I'm, I'm very interested in, in the resources and tools that both Chris and, and Ray has mentioned. So I'm lo looking to, to learn more. So uh, on some self-promotion, go to globalinnovationforum.com and uh, we will have all of the uh, panels and the videos and then we'll have some resources. So have patience, we're filling in those resources because they just come at us in torrents. Um, being Los Angeles, as Chris had mentioned, you know, everybody 
who makes it to the top of the internationalization and the, and the trade industry always want to come here and they end up here. So, uh, and of course we have the best ports, you know, in the world We have the number one manufacturing base, uh, anything and everything can go through here and experts will touch it at every point. And again, as, as we want to reiterate, and the whole reason we're here is the majority of these resources and programs and tools are absolutely free and they're from the public sector and nonprofits and, uh, and academia here. So, um, Ray, how about uh, the biggest challenge that you would flag for small business as they look abroad? So with, with both of these companies, to me, one of the biggest challenges is having someone to talk to, to brainstorm your business model. You know, someone with experience who can help walk you through these things. So in, in business A, one of the first things I thought about it, it sounded like a lot like a client that we recently um, recently assisted. So, um, you know, if you're a startup and you've spun off from a larger company, we, we recently had a company that did training and they were looking at an opportunity with a huge vendor. So what had happened was they were, they were with a larger company, they had made some huge corporate contacts and then they were spun off. So now here they've got this startup company with far less resources, but these sales opportunities. So one of the things that we had to work with them on is what loan programs, what infrastructure could they put in as a startup to help them take advantage of some of those opportunities they had as a, as a, you know, as a startup that was just spun off, you know, a three-year-old company. Um, one of the other things too is with a lot of service companies, they don't understand that that's one of the greatest opportunities for export. Um, in fact, I, I, I had a student some years ago and he said, if you could export anything, what would it be? And this was maybe eight years ago. And I said, well, information, you know, the, one of the things the world can't get enough of is services and information. And he said, uh, great, sounds like a good idea. So I, I didn't hear from the student for a couple of years. And then he said, hey, I, uh, this is when you feel dumb when you give someone advice because he came back to me and he said, hey, I took your advice and I started uh, a website and I started advising people on how to trade stocks. And uh, now I have a uh, website where people pay me to do that. And I said, really? I said, how many users do you have? He says, well, I've got a million users, but only 50,000 are paid, but those 50,000 pay me you know, 20 to $50 uh, a month and, uh, you know, huge business. So we often don't talk about um, all of the great opportunities when you're selling a service. Um, the other thing I would relate to both of these companies too, is there's a lot of contracting opportunities. So we talk about trade agreements. There's actually a trade advocacy office that helps firms identify um, procurement opportunities in other countries. Um, so that's an opportunity for both goods producers as well as um, service-based companies. Um, in terms of Africa, I know in our own staff, we have uh, two experts on Africa who, um, who put a lot of uh, interest in that. You know, the one interesting thing about Africa, and it doesn't have so much to do with the first um, example as the second, but e-commerce has really expanded some of the opportunities we have from Africa, in Africa, just because a lot of the things that are usually logistical barriers are kind of taken away or minimized when you do e-commerce and you can trade through a platform. Um, with the next company, the tech wearable company, um, we recently had, um, we had a client a uh, couple of years ago and this client was uh, developing a wearable technology that was actually allowing hearing aids to be recharged. And you know, most hearing aids use batteries uh, that you have to replace. And they made the first rechargeable one that could last for weeks. And so they found that they had an opportunity selling to Europe. But one of the things they feared is if they get it wrong, if they get the compliance wrong, if, if they don't get the sales pipeline right, it would almost be a one-shot exercise. So that particular company, we spent close to a year with them just looking at their business model, both from a compliance standpoint and a market entry standpoint. So they were able to sit down with experts that we had in both compliance and sales in Europe 
just to discuss how they would implement that plan. Well, as a result, that company went from zero revenue the first year that we worked with them to 26 million in, in the uh, product release stage. In the second year, they doubled. In the third year, they tripled. So they, they actually made uh, um, in the top 100 in uh, Inc. Magazine. But again, you know, it was a good year or so that we worked with that, that company just on compliance and their sales model. Um, and, and again, you know, uh, this uh, plan, this second company that gained recognition, uh, trade shows, um, those international trade shows are a great way to showcase your product. And actually that company that did the rechargeable hearing aid, that's actually how they generated interest in the EU from going to those trade shows and generating interest in those customers. And in all of those cases, in both cases, you know, it's, it's one thing getting information and data, and that's very critical to your business plan. But at the end of it, you need to sit down with experts with experience, whether they're from the US uh, Department of Commerce, whether they're from our uh, Small Business Development Center or from the District Export Council, it's really important to take the information you have and ground truth it with some people who have been there. And so that socializing between entrepreneurs is so critical. Right. Uh, speaking of people who have been there, Chris, I'm gonna throw this question to you very quickly because we're already at the top of the next hour. Uh, as the US Consul General and being stationed around the country, I'm sorry, around the globe, in embassies and consulates helping larger US companies like Caterpillar and AT&T, uh, the problems that they face at their size, what was the one thing they kept uh, running up against and what was their challenge? So we can give some aspiration to the startup founders here. <laughs> um, yes, um, it, you know, it, it's surprising, but um, e even the large, larger companies, it, it's just understanding the local market it's in these it, it's these soft squishy things that the cross cultural dimensions um, and just continuing to build that into your uh, decision making process your uh, management that you choose your training processes your your reaching out to the to the uh, local base and so forth where, where they they ran into problems was just trying to do a um, one size fits all and then not having the people back at headquarters understand, um, you know, that, uh, that everything would had to be sort of a uniform mold coming out of headquarters. Um, it requires a lot of flexibility. Uh, it's a delicate uh, balance there, but even the best guys make colossal mistakes. I've seen that. So. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, go ahead. Rick. In fact, to leverage off of Chris's point, a lot of times the only difference is larger companies can afford some of those mistakes. <laughs> so they end up spending a lot more money on the learning curve, but um, either way, it's learning how to innovate and adapt to those uh, target markets. Excellent, okay, so it's after six o'clock. Uh, we have one question for Veronica. Essentially, does Market Finder deliver lesser markets if that's what uh, you're going for. And if you don't want to compete with the big guys in the big markets, is there a way to take a, one of, one of the more successful folks that we worked with, they had a love for a certain country because they loved to vacation there and that's, that's how they chose. You know, it, it wasn't data, it wasn't you know, potential, it was I want to go there and do business as much as possible. So. And it was a very small market and, and she did very well, so. Mm -hmm. Sure, so once you log into the Market Finder tool, then you're able to select what countries that you would like to deep dive into and access more information for, right? So, you know, when we when we looked at the video earlier and when you are when you first visit Market Finder, it's first going to show you um, market recommendations based on the factors that we have discussed prior. Um, however, if you're interested in markets that 
are not as competitive, or if you have a particular market in mind, then you can certainly sort through the data to see, okay, which are the ones are where um, there's still interest in your product or service or your categories, right, um, online, but they may not be as competitive. So you're able to see all of that data in the dashboard of Market Finder. Likewise, if you already know that you want to export to Africa, for instance, or to the UK, for instance, you can type those countries directly into the Market Finder tool, and then you can see all of the, the data that is associated and available for those markets. Great. Hope that answers your question, Charlie. Um, one question. So, for example, my co-chair at the Los Angeles Venture Association Global Community, she represents the Grenoble region of France. That's the supercomputing, sort of the Stanford, you know, equivalent of the country of France in that region. Is it possible to dial down into geographic regions based on sector strength? For Google Market Finder, not at this time. What's interesting though, is that we are testing this. So for instance, um, you'll find that for the US, that after you enter in your, your website and you describe the industries that are most relevant for, for your business, that you'll have the opportunity to say, okay, I want to export within the US or I want to export outside of the US. So for the US right now, we're testing the ability to determine um, what other states or other regions that you might want to consider um, expanding your business to within the US. For France, that's not available right now. Um, however, there are other tools such as Google Trends, for instance, where you can deep dive into specific regions of, of France for particular industries to see how searches might fluctuate over time in that market. Um, Michael? Sure, yeah. To, to build on that, that question a little, usually the reason that someone goes for a market that's not one of the bigger markets is usually because they know that market and they can penetrate that market more easily. Um, if that's not the reason, go for the bigger market because usually in bigger markets, it's a little bit easier to break in because there's so many competitors. A lot of times you can go to a small market and it can you know, what you think might be easier, you'll have fewer competitors concentrating on you. So for example, I had a, a client that made a, um, made a product that went into uh, assembly lines and the owner of the company, the founder was a Green Beret and spent a lot of time in Germany. So he started his first international market with Germany and they got a lot of momentum with Germany, but then all of a sudden they were up against a lot of vertical integration by their own customers. And one of the mark, and so we did a market analysis and we said, well, how about Mexico? And he said, well, I had this bad experience once in Mexico. And we said, do you realize that Mexico is 15 times bigger than your German market? If you had the same market share, you would literally have a, a lot more. So we urged him to, you know, go through, find the right partner well, a couple of years later, I said, how's it going? He said, oh, business is great. I said, how's it going in Germany? Oh, terrible. They vertically integrated. They competed against us, but we made it up in Mexico. So, you know, you, you always want to be careful at the temptation of saying, well, a smaller market will be easier because sometimes it's the opposite, you know, especially if you're in a market that's, you know, just a couple competitors, well, you get off the plane and they already know you've landed. All right, excellent, excellent. That uh, kind of makes my head spin how many different entities were, were mentioned tonight. Um, Veronica, I mean, your, your entity itself was, was amazingly deep in everything that it uh, provides. So uh, it's after six o'clock. I want to be respectful of everybody's Monday evening. So Ray, thank you. Chris, thank you. Veronica, thank you so much. Uh, particularly uh, another shout out to Jake in Jamaica and Terry, uh, Milken, LMU, Global Lavo, International Business Accelerator. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, and I, I also put in uh, a little bit there that we've had such fun delivering all this information to startup founders and, and SME leaders that, uh, that we're now thinking of maybe doing a sector specific uh, break off, breakout uh, uh, events. So startup global SoCal for digital media entertainment or uh, consumer product goods or food and beverage or cosmetics. So uh, if you are interested in that, 
I put my email here, uh, Terry Batch, email us both and let us know your desires on that. And uh, thank you everybody who's been involved and, and participated and attended. And uh, this will all be archived on globalinnovationforum.com. And with that, I wish everyone a good night. Thank you.